Coming up on Tech News Today, you're only 4.74 steps away from me, at least according to Facebook. Software industry withdraws support for SOPA, sort of, and Samsung and LG are back in Google TV. All that and more coming up next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Tuesday, November 22nd, 2011. Tech News Today is brought to you by Ford, featuring available Sync with My Ford Touch. Sync with My Ford Touch gets you to your destination with integrated turn-by-turn -turn directions and directional arrows displayed on screen. Check it out in the new 2012 Ford Focus and at Ford.com slash technology. And by the Epson Workforce Pro, the world's fastest two-sided printer. Engineered for productivity, it delivers high-speed, automatic, two-sided color printing, copying, scanning, and faxing to keep your business running at full speed. Plus, you'll save on ink. The Epson Workforce Pro. Check it out at Epson.com. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Aya Zaktar. I'm Jason Howell. And this is the show where we kick around the tech news of the day, try to make some sense of it all, and helping us to make some sense today, Mr. Christopher Null, editor of the Intuit Small Business blog. Fifth Not time. Not on me. Fifth time TNT here. We, we have no idea how to make sense of anything. It's all on you. Oh, jeez. <laughs> well, look, he's a gentleman and a scholar. It proves it. Yeah. Uh, with That's it. right. Is that, uh, what, is that your actual diploma hanging behind you there? It sure is. My mother would be disappointed <laughs> if I didn't display them. <laughs> well, your mom will be very proud. Uh, I need to do that. I think the last time you were on the show, I had the same reaction where I was like, you know what? I really should do that. So I'm going to. Okay. I'm just going to hang them right all behind you right on the bookshelf. Here. Yeah. And on the bookshelf. Well, let's all bring it's our, our diploma. I have some in, in a box at my they house. They look good. Yeah. They're useless. Uh, let's start off with our continuing coverage of oh, patent wars. Patent wars. Dang it. Dun, it's not like you dun, didn't know it was dun, coming, dun, Jason. Dun. Every day. First off, the International sure. Trade Commission of the United States has ruled that Apple did not violate any of the related patents to HTC and will end its investigation of the case. Uh, these are the S three graphics patents that HTC acquired uh, and then went after Apple. HTC's general counsel, Grace Lee, said that the company respects the ruling but will consider an appeal after evaluating it. So we may not see the end of that yet. <laughs> we respect this ruling, well, just, but we'll challenge it. We respectfully disagree. But the other side like, we think this is garbage. This is coming out like a baseball manager, like, this is unacceptable, and just get fined. I mean, that's not going to happen. Well, what do they pay? $300 million mm. to acquire S3? Yep. So they, at this point, it, they kind of have to stay all in. Also, the European Commission decided to open an investigation into warfare, uh, as the register puts it, between Apple and Samsung. Uh, the EU Competition Commissioner Joaquin Alumnia told Reuters, in particular in the IT sector, it is obvious that Apple and Samsung are not the only case. Uh, they are only one case where IP rights can be used as an instrument to restrict competition. But they're the biggest case because they're all over. They're in Australia, they're in the United States, in Germany, in the Netherlands, uh, pretty much the patent, every continent. Uh, they're on the world tour. They are on the world, the patent war world tour. They're trying to go around so. the world, I think. So uh, they are, the European co Competition Commissioner is going to look and see if they're abusing their rights if they're if they're reducing innovation by asserting their patents and patents are meant to encourage innovation it was reducing competition right not innovation there's a difference there because you can innovate and make your competition a little bit more annoyed i mean but i think this is about competition because now you're stopping distortion other, of competition you're, you're absolutely stopping, correct you're stopping uh, other companies from going out there and trying to implement a variant of what you what you think you have a patent on the question is what it's always what's the scope of your patent and are you infringing and this this litigation obviously stops products like samsung's galaxy tab from entering mm -hmm. certain locations i mean you saw the redesign that magnificent redesign with the extra bezel mm -hmm. which after seeing i saw a video of it it actually looked a little different it was it had these little speaker ears and maybe you wouldn't see that as an ipad so it, it did stop so many things so we'll see if it restricts competition kindle fire or playbook kindle fire or playbook quick tell me well, it's Playbook because it doesn't say Amazon. Let me on see it. the back. Oh, yeah. You look <laughs> Chris, what do you make of all this stuff? Does this patent war stuff just make your eyes glaze over or, or does it get your back up? It makes my eyes glaze over. I'm, I'm over it now. I mean, we've been having this since uh, 
Microsoft versus Apple days in the 80s, and it always ends with somebody writing a check to somebody else and everybody moving along and copying everyone anyway. I mean, look at all of the yeah. copycat Android phones and tablets. I mean, everything's, everything converges no matter what the patent system does. It needs to be reformed. Yeah, well, that's what I was going to ask because, you know, it does seem like it's even worse. It's the same old thing, but Apple and Samsung just, it seems like it's either it's given more attention or it's, it's blown up. <laughs> Uh, a lot more. Usually, at Microsoft and Apple only went after each other in one or two areas at a time instead of like seven. But you yeah. what kind of patent reform do we need? Well, it, it's worse now because now it takes place on a global yeah. on a global stage. I mean, before it used to be uh, Europe and America, and that was it. And now you have the entire world really at stake. I mean, uh, China wasn't the power it was back in uh, the the Windows ninety five uh, antitrust era. Um, what needs to happen is I think software patents need to be gotten rid of altogether. That needs to be handled, handled via copyright. Um, patenting software algorithms becomes just a, a nightmare uh, that is what ties up the court because especially the courts don't really even understand what they're ruling on either. Yeah, I feel like the, the courts need to be educated or at least some somehow expert witnesses need to be better vetted or maybe the patent office needs to have uh, simpler rules to follow. But there are a lot of evidence of people not understanding what's going on. Now, right. I, as you're, you're a big defender of the patent system and, <clears throat> and the benefits that it can bring. What, what, do, you, what do you say to this? I'm do, I defend the concepts behind it. Right, the, right. the actual, what's actually happening is, is, is a little bit strange. I mean, the way things have been interpreted, that you can patent uh, certain software processes and things like that, whether that was, that was for a court to decide. And they said, yeah, you could. I mean, that's the thing. They have to figure out what's going on there. But I mean, I, for the most part, the theory is this stuff becomes public domain after a term of years. Now, what gets people nuts is that, oh, look, the iPhone came out, and now I can't have anything like it for 20 years from another company. Well, maybe the term should be shorter. Maybe there's yeah. a different thing there. But like, yeah. would you have spent all this money figuring out an interface like that, spend, spend years of research and, um, and time and, and manpower without this protection? That's always the question, because it could take you more than five years to make something like this. Because we know in the, in the jobs book, it took them at least three years to come up with some kind of interface. I would look, you look at the clothing industry, though, and they, they spend a lot of money and time designing things that they can't trademark, they can't patent. You can get a design patent on certain things like, like a Louis Vuitton bag or something. That's sure. You can stop that kind of thing. Uh, you can get a, I thought it was a, yeah, yeah, it's like a trademark patent. But, the, like but the actual design of it, I can go make a bag that looks like that as mm -hmm. long as I don't infringe the trademark. Right, but you... If patents don't apply to these things, I mean, this is just the way the system is. Yeah, I, I'm not saying why? it's. it's, it's yeah. what, why is it? Well, I mean, but why is the system like that with one thing and not with the other? I think because they are very similar, right? The design of a shirt, if it's very specific and has really you know long pointy collars, is the same as the design of a tablet having some function that some other tablet wants. It might to also have I mean, to do I with the components the that go into things. Yeah. I mean, a uh, Louis Vuitton bag. Uh, might be made out of high quality leather and then I could make something out of pleather that mm. looks just like it but you could argue well it's actually not even made with any of the same kind of components and electronics it's a little bit harder to do that I'm at KC in the chat room. Can Matt McCarty writes for The Verge and shows up on Twill a lot he's talking about design patents and trade dress on shirts so there are protection for these other things they're just not patents I mean they're well yeah. design patents I never wear a trade dress I don't look good in those <laughs> <laughs> and I like the idea of a pleather iPhone by the way so they yeah. need to get on that. Yeah, Steve Animal Jobs friendly. rolling over in his grave at that idea. Into it. <laughs> uh, a lot of HP news today as well. Not all of it coming from the earnings call yesterday. VentureBeat reporting that HP has made licensing WebOS for printers a condition for anyone who wants to purchase WebOS from HP. So they're selling WebOS, but if you want to buy it, you have to give them favorable licensing of WebOS for the printers. My guess is because they're making a bunch of printers that have WebOS stuck in here, right? Well, yeah, I mean, we've seen an HP printer that had this uh, weird tablet attached to it. I remember seeing it at the PC Mag offices. I'm like, why does this printer have a detachable WebOS tablet? I mean, there are some things you can do right from this kind of interface. Because you remember, like, the old printers where you would go into that one-line display when you had to change a job or read something that was wrong or, like, you want to even edit a video, uh, not a video, a photo. <laughs> you get those little tiny three-inch displays versus WebOS, which, you know, you can edit your, your actual photo before you print it without even needing to go to a computer. Couldn't I do that on a computer? Yeah, you could, but sometimes you just want to get around that. You don't want well, to Where did the print how did the photo get to the printer in the first place? You took it on you the can tablet. You send it wirelessly in From some cases. Right. SD cards. All right. <laughs>
There. Mm, I'm skeptical. Score one. Uh, Intel and Qualcomm are apparently still in the running to buy WebOS, according to the VentureBeat story. Uh, no word on Amazon lately, though, which is what was always my favorite uh, when I was thinking about who might buy this. Chris, can you think of anybody who would benefit from getting WebOS that should be in the running? Well, I, for one, welcome our WebOS overlords. <laughs> um, but, uh, no, I, I'm still baffled by the whole WebOS. Uh, I'm still trying to figure out why they bought Palm in the first place. Uh, I think they are, too. They would do with it. <laughs> uh, so, so, no, I think this is a, a kind of silly move. NPD Group uh, study found that HP is the country's second leading tablet manufacturer. That's very sad news for anybody who's not Apple. Uh, according to their statistics, HP in 2011, up through October anyway, responsible for 17% of non-Apple tablet sales, 204,000 units. Uh, Samsung is number two or number three behind Apple and, and HP with 16% and 192,000. Uh, mostly the Samsung Galaxy Tab there. Now, MPD does exclude Kindles and Nooks. They don't, they don't count e-readers. They count those as e-readers, not tablets at this stage. So the Nook might be well in front of these if they were counted. Uh, it's, it's a little odd to me that they wouldn't. I mean, I understand that original Nooks and Kindles would be e-readers, not tablets, but the lines are really blurred now. I know that the Fire, for example, might not be counted in this uh, NPD survey until maybe the same one next year. But even then, if they still exclude them, that's a tablet. Well, and I think when the, I, I think up until the uh, the Nook Color, these were definitely e-readers. Mm -hmm. they, they were loosely tablets, but they were e-readers. The Nook Color is the one that straddled the line. Now with the Nook tablet and the Kindle Fire, they have become tablety. People still vigorously argue that they're not tablets; mm -hmm. that they're just supercharged e-readers. Uh, and they shouldn't be classed in the same class as an iPad. If, if you can watch movies, download apps, access the internet, and read books, that's a tablet. Where's the line? Is it a five-inch device, seven-inch device? I mean, if if, if uh, NPD was including the Galaxy Tab Seven, right, that, that mm -hmm. one, then the Fire should be included. Exactly. And the Nook Color eventually, the Nook Color tablet should be included there. But like, I'm kind of curious about where does the Note fit in the five-inch device that mm -hmm. Samsung has and the players that are. And the Lenovo's working on a five-inch tablet now too. And the phones that are reaching 4.7. I mean, like, it's starting to feel like okay, you can do all of these things on a phone. And, you know, larger devices, what is the line of... This definition is kind of murky. I, I mean, I feel like a tablet, is, I mean, could be an iPod Touch, honestly. I know it's a small one, but it's not a phone. It's a tablet. Do you have a definition of a tablet, Christopher? Yeah, I, I was thinking exactly the same thing about the iPod Touch. I mean, it, it, what is it? I mean, is it a... It, I think most people think of it as an MP3 player still. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if this is just now an issue of semantics and... Are we just going to have to become a mobile device and anything that has a touch screen is what ends up in uh, studies like this? Or, or do they just cut off, the, do they cut off the survey at a certain screen size? It's probably what they do if, you look at the, if we look at the, uh, the raw data. Well, the Kindle Fire and the Nook tablet are very interesting in this respect because they aren't competing with the iPad on price, right? They're significantly cheaper and also do less than the iPad is capable of doing. So there is a legitimate difference between those and maybe there should be a way to look at them separately but roughly speaking they're they're tablets i mean well, i would bet i would bet next year these those devices are going to show up in the survey though i yeah. mean kindle fire is is really competing with less expensive android tablets right now and final and piece yeah yeah i agree too Final piece of HP news. Uh, during her earnings call yesterday, Meg Whitman uh, said that Facebooks and Googles, <laughs> they, she was using them as categoricals, the Facebooks and Googles of the world have been calling HP about servers because HP uh, got in front of hard drives. Now, we hear a lot of bad things about HP and how disorganized they are, but apparently they got together in a war room when the flooding hit Thailand and we knew that there was going to be a problem with the delivery of hard drives from a lot of factories and HP cornered the market. Uh, not literally cornered the market, but they made sure that their supplies were secure. Uh, they bought up supplies and made sure that they had enough hard drives to weather the storm. And they think it's, it's going to be pretty hard, Q1 and Q2, for people to get a hold of hard drives. So the big companies are turning to HP for this. That's it's one of those things I, I want to throw out there because we hear a lot of bad things about WebOS and tablets and personal systems group not, not doing so well for HP. But here's an example of something they did right. Good job. And all those hard drives have WebOS on them. <laughs> <laughs> you think so? They're all going to be pre-installed. <laughs> just in case. Yeah, just in case. Uh, the Facebook uh, and Univers... The Facebook. I don't know why I decided to call it under Facebook's. its like, oh, take Harvard, it Harvard name. Yeah. Uh, Facebook and the University in Milano, uh, Italy, did a joint study 
and they found that Facebook users on average are 4.74 steps away from any other Facebook user. Now, you've heard about six degrees of separation. You've played the Kevin Bacon game. Apparently on Facebook, you're much tighter, uh, even though it has its, you know, 700, 800 million users there. In 2008, the distance from any one Facebook user was on average 5.28 hops. So people have been getting closer. It's now only 4.74. And people tend to friend people like themselves. So in your own country, you're actually probably around three steps away from any other person in the same country. So, I know that um, this study says, on average, most people have less than 100 friends. Could you say, oh, well, you know, people just friend other people that they don't know, so it's going to skew everything. Yeah, it was 190 friends if you count all the people with 5,000, but if you kind of adjust for that, then it goes down to around 100. Okay, so you said the vast majority of people are pretty much just friending people on Facebook that they actually know. But then there are people who friend people because they have a nice profile picture or whatever. So it's like, yeah, I mean, that might not skew the results that much for everybody, but it still does skew things. You don't like the idea of being this close to a bunch of other people. I kind of don't, <laughs> no. It's just, it's not, it's not realistic. So what's the end result, though? Like, that means that if I need to ask for a favor from the most famous person on Facebook, I'm only five people away? Does that work that way? Um, well, you're less than theoretically, five people yeah. away. Well, I, I, guess, I guess the better question is, is Kevin Bacon on Facebook? And how, if so, how close am I to Kevin how Bacon? How did we not? We have failed <laughs> in our research. To check if we could reach Kevin Bacon or Mark Zuckerberg. Right. We needed to or be that, on this in our prep or meeting. Or Beast the Dog. Where is Kevin Bacon on the on Facebook? I just, you know how... You, so you don't believe 4.74. I, I totally believe it because statistically speaking, we're relatively close to each other around the world. We're six degrees of separation. But I just don't... It's, it's, it's math. Look at all of your friends, the friends of the friends that you have on Facebook. You don't know hardly any of those people. I mean, I don't know the person who works at the Irish pub down the street. I could go in and introduce myself and then we're friends, but... Well, what does that, it matter if I never do that? That goes to Ayaz's point, which is uh, it doesn't have much practical use if you can't get anything out of it. But yeah, but that's <laughs> if why they, they can't but, give me but, money. But it's not about that. What it's a, is the point? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Chris, are, 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 yeah, I actually, I was going to say I, I found that uh, data actually pretty profound, and looking at the way that that number is dropping, uh, it really made me think a lot about it. I mean, when is the last time? somebody sent you a funny picture or a link and you hadn't already seen it from someone else. I mean, nobody, there's nothing new on, online anymore because everybody is sharing everything with everyone else. And that's really what the power of, of social networks like Facebook have done. I, I think it's, it's interesting, uh, even if it is sort of like, well, this is just Facebook, it's not the world. Uh, but conceivably, if I needed to get a hold or send an urgent message to anyone on Facebook, it would only take four hops. You know, pass this along to somebody you know, and then that person will pass it along to somebody they know, and then and then eventually you would get to that person. It just, I don't know, it blows my mind. Well, that is also that... I can send <laughs> Kevin Bacon a message. No. And I think you should. I hope I think you I'm do. I'm going to right Is that his now. page or his personal? Mm. Hey, That's Kevin, I know somebody who knows someone who knows a point four person who knows you. It's a small and world I'd like to after chat. all. <laughs> That's my You point. could probably just show up at his house in Hollywood well, it's a small and get world, better results. A big asterisk there, like no China, no India, or wherever Facebook's not. Well, it's a small world even without Facebook, but it's even smaller on Facebook. Okay. Paul, you guys, you guys are dead inside. This doesn't, this doesn't impress you no, at I all. I didn't argue about that. Mm. I'm impressed. I just, again, but let's, okay, now what? <laughs> what do I do with it? <laughs> what do we do with Where's it? Where's my money? <laughs> We well, should start asking. Money is it's coming from the sponsor. <laughs> Time to take that a break. This episode of Tech News Today is brought to you by Ford, featuring Sync with My Ford Touch. Sync is the in-car communications, entertainment, and connectivity system that's voice activated to help you keep your hands on the wheel and your eyes on the road. One of the great features of Sync is Sync Services. Gives you audible turn-by-turn -turn directions where you want to go. Uh, displays directional arrows on the screen so you know which direction just at a glance that you're supposed to turn. All without having to purchase an aftermarket or integrated navigation. It's all part of Sync. You don't have to buy something, install it, deal with DVDs in the trunk, any of that stuff. Uh, check it out. Send to Sync. Let's you go into Google Maps, pick your route, save it to your app, the Sync Destinations app, available in app stores. Uh, and then when you get in the car, you just say whatever you called it. You said call it home. 
You just say, take me home. Or if you call it route to grandma's house, route to grandma's house, puts it up, starts giving you the turn-by-turn -turn directions. You listen, you watch the, the arrows, you're on your way. Nav Plus, you can get traffic updates too sent to your phone so you know how to avoid all of those clogs on the road. It's all designed to help keep you safe, get you where you're going nice and safe. Check it out on the 2012 Ford Focus, and you can learn more about this and other technologies Ford is bringing to its vehicles at Ford.com slash technology. We thank them for their support of Tech News Today. All right, who wants to see ice cream sandwich? Me. The operating system? Yeah, the operating system, Sarah. I'm selected about oh. that. I'm okay. You still up for it? Yeah. Chris, you up, uh, you up for some ice cream sandwich? Let's do this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's uh, thanks to NVIDIA, actually. Like, shortly after a pirated YouTube, not a pirated, but a kind of a weird independent YouTube video came up, NVIDIA released a video of the Asus Transformer Prime with a Tegra 3 processor, that's NVIDIA's processor inside, running Ice Cream Sandwich. Shows the ability to drag one app icon atop another to form an app folder, just like iOS does. Uh, full 1080p video uh, demonstration of the Riptide GP game uh, that gives you the beautiful water because that's you're, you're floating around, driving around on water game. Uh, it shows shows the rendering ability of the chip. Uh, just I don't know. What do you think, Jason? You're a, you're you're all about Android Coast. You, uh, <laughs> I, you get I, this gets you salivating for some ice cream sandwich on a tablet. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, that, that's the next the next thing that I really want. Now that I have an uh, ice cream sandwich on a Nexus S that's rooted, I have my Galaxy Tab, and I'm waiting for someone to port ice cream sandwich over to the Galaxy Tab so I can experience it there. Absolutely. Of course I want to see this, but it looks great. Um, and they said that it would scale to tablets well. And I mean, it's it's a short preview, but uh, yeah, it looks It slick. looks awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it looks often on Integra 3. I mean, mm -hmm. this is a controlled situation, advanced hardware, not something we're going to be seeing right away. But but most of what you see, aside from the Riptide kind of example, is what you should probably expect on any um, ice cream sandwich tablet. Because it's all just the the regular underlying OS UI. So. And one of the other videos actually showed a web page being loaded. Apparently, it's a lot faster now than it was on Honeycomb. I mean, I don't know what the Honeycomb experience was like. Well, that's it's so hard to show, though. I mean, yeah. it could depend on the server that's serving the web page and the, 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 well, Google's the connection that you've got. Built-in browser has been kind of panned for, for Android, hasn't it? That's why people like Dolphin and other alternatives out mm -hmm. there. Yeah, and supposedly, the ice cream sandwich browser is supposed to be a big improvement uh, from what we're used to. I haven't played around with the browser on my ice cream sandwich. Yet. Christopher, are you uh, into the into the Android at all? Or Yeah, absolutely. I've reviewed a lot of Android tablets. Um, I do think this looks pretty slick. I'm, I'm getting a little tired of all of the skins that the various companies are putting on top of uh, Android because they don't like exactly the way it works. And, and I'm looking forward to a little convergence, I think, <laughs> with, with the way ice cream sandwich is looking. Yeah. No, it, it looks nice. It's it's hard for me to get excited about such a tightly controlled video that is as much showing off the Tegra three processor as it is ice cream sandwich. But it's it yeah I got I got no complaints about it either. Uh, moving on to more Google operating system news. Yoon Bu Keen, president of Samsung's TV division, told Reuters Samsung is currently in last stage talks with Google to launch a Google TV based device that will be different from those of competitors. So, it will be different from Logitech it in that it will be updated. Oh, it, <laughs> <laughs> it will be a new piece of software. Yay. I, uh, yeah, I know. I've got a Logitech review too. I'm still waiting for that, uh, for that update as well. I think that, well, they said they're not going to unveil it at CES. It's going to be done after the first of the year in a, in a Samsung event. LG is rumored to have a CES announcement regarding Google TV. Uh, so I would assume that Samsung would want to go before CES because we're a week later than we usually are. Or it's they could wait right to see what year. LG does and then go after CES. I guess so, although I'm sure whatever they have to announce, they can't really change in a few days based on whatever LG says. Yeah, but they can change the messaging. Yeah, that's true. And try to react to it. So Samsung building in Google TV, I mean, they have their smart TV initiative. They have apps already. It's painfully slow on my television. I know that. So, I'm But Sony's got uh, Google TV uh, already, so that's not different. He says this is going to differ from those of competitors. How could, it, how could it differ? Well, I mean, Samsung already makes phones with Google. Why not try to do some of that same kind of thing? Why not do a processor, do some kind of, actually some great specs? That's something that could be Samsung really helpful. Samsung makes chips. They could they could make a device that uses Samsung chips instead of Intel. Android already runs on on these ARM processors. Why not instead of these? Like I think Sam, does Samsung use Intel in their in their televisions, something like that. So I mean, this would be a big difference. And hopefully, I mean, 
it'd be faster than that experience that currently exists because the app selection on televisions, that market's kind of like, all right, it's kind of nice there. Samsung has an interest in you know, updating those every now and then, but Google's got a much larger interest in going, look. But how is this still, apps. I mean, that's different from what Samsung has done in the past, but he says differ from those of competitors. I assume he means Sony and Logitech. Touch whiz kind of thing, kind of. Like, I mean, a scanning. Uh, I don't mean an actual touch whiz of touching the television. Which that's interesting. Would be weird, but so why it's, not? It's Google TV with a Samsung skin. Samsung likes the skin. Now, Christopher, you were just saying you're tired of all those skins. Would you want to see on one TV? on a Google TV? Well, I, I think the the skin market on the television has not yet matured, so I, I'm I'm going to welcome that for <laughs> for Google TV yeah. and Samsung. I don't know. Um, you know, I. Right now, it's kind of a good luck with whatever you're going to do with Google TV because, like everyone's been saying, it's not really shown up in any meaningful way that anyone's happy with yet. So, I kind of agree that it's it's it too, it's a little late not to have it at CES. Maybe they will have it before CES, uh, but you you want it to be talked about at CES. But then I guess, I guess Apple has been very good about saying, you know what, we're not going to have our announcement during CES, or if we do, we're going to dominate the CES news by making it. I'm not sure Samsung has that weight to throw around. Though. Unless their announcement is so amazing that they say, you go ahead, LG, and they'll talk about you for two days until our announcement, and then everyone will forget. I guess the other thing, I mean, we're not thinking big enough here. I mean, let's, if it's going to really differ, it should have a service built into it. So it's mm -hmm. not just about, uh, I mean, we're seeing this with the Kindle Fire. It's not just about putting out a device that runs Android. It's about putting out a device that has access to the content. And maybe that's how it differs from competitors is, hey, you can get it built into Samsung TVs or you can get a standalone box. But either way, you're going to have access to this Samsung marketplace that we secretly negotiated uh, with Hollywood that gives you access to all these great movies and services and Hulu and, and all this, this stuff that you don't get on your standard Google TV box, or maybe maybe the Samsung boxes unblock NBC.com and, and, and all of that stuff. I'm just wondering, could it be possible that Google's content deals that they're pulling, putting together with YouTube, maybe there's something special linked with this and the Samsung televisions, like you have more access and more content available if you buy this version of the television versus, or if their box, versus going with uh, a competitor? Yeah, that's what I'm saying, exactly. Yeah, yeah. you get, you get some good special access. Tom, I think they really want to get people to talk about it at CES. It has to be hardware. It's got to be yeah. big. It's got to be something they show off. Nobody talks about services and integration at CES. It just doesn't, it isn't fun enough to dominate the discussion. Yeah, you may be right. They should just come out with the Samsung TV uh, that looks exactly like the Apple TV with a different bezel. <laughs> Uh, let's finish up with the Business Software Alliance uh, putting up a posting. Some people are saying they're withdrawing their support of the Stop Online Piracy Act. The way I read it, they are moderating their support of the Stop Online Piracy Act. Uh, Robert Holliman wrote on the Business Software Alliance blog. Remember, we talked about this earlier this week. Business Software Alliance, made up of folks like Microsoft and Apple and EA, they were supporting SOPA up until today. Uh, in the post, he says, valid and important questions have been raised about the bill. It is intended to get at worst of the worst offenders. As it now stands, however, it could sweep in more than just truly egregious actors. That's the part everybody's quoting to say, well, look, they're, they're against SOPA now. But it goes on to say, to fix this problem, definitions of who can be the subject of legal actions and what remedies are imposed must be tightened and narrowed. So they go on to talk about due process and free speech and, and, and security of the DNS system, but they don't back away from the need from SOPA. Uh, they talk about changing it to address these concerns. So it's, it's, they're still technically supporting it. They just want it to be overhauled. It sounds like they're being vague purposely because they're trying to figure out, okay, what exactly could we suggest as an alternative? Yeah. They're not quite there yet. They're watering Valid down. Valid and important questions have been raised. Thank you. They're, yeah, they're starting to slowly <laughs> Thank back you, Business away. Software Alliance. They want to distance themselves from all of the vitriol around it. Right. Uh, meanwhile, Senator Ron Wyden has vowed to block not only the Protect IP Act in the Senate, but also SOPA, if it made it over to the Senate, with a filibuster, or as it is called by Boing Boing, an epic filibuster. Uh, and StopCensorship.org is getting in on the act, hoping he'll read into the record the names of every American who signs the petition against the bill. A filibuster is usually one uh, senator or congressman dominating the debate on end by just talking. 
And a lot of times they've read cookbook recipes and dictionaries. And, and so it, it wouldn't be necessarily unthinkable that he would just read into the congressional record everyone who'd signed this petition. And Wyden is also the guy who's, he stopped, I think, Protect IP and Koika. I can never get that right. Koi, he killed Koika. He's delayed Protect Yeah, so he's, IP. he's stopped these things before. So, I mean, he's, uh, if you guys are in his district, you should vote for him. If you like him. are against SOPA and Protect IP, maybe you're for it. Then you should vote against it. Uh, here's why I think you might not want SOPA, though. Uh, we talk a lot about the Stop Online Piracy Act and how it will break DNS or will make DNS more insecure. And I thought we, we had a really good article on the register come out yesterday that explained how this is so. We'll have it in the show notes on our wiki at twit.tv slash TNT. But here's, here's the breakdown, okay? The way DNS works now is very insecure because you can have what's called a man-in-the-middle attack, right? If I say, I want to go to saralane.com, my ISP sends me to a database where it looks up saralane.com and says, oh, well, that's 168.3 point whatever, that server, and then it calls on that server, and Sarah's website gets delivered to me. A man-in-the-middle attack would actually hijack that process and say, well, actually, I'm going to point saralane.com at my server, which is full of malware. What SOPA suggests is that the government act as a man-in-the-middle. So when I go to my ISP that is a U.S. ISP and I ask for saralane.com, it says, eh, pirate site, we're either not going to give a response or we're going to respond with some, you know, immigration's custom, uh, some ICE page instead. Well, that's essentially a man-in-the-middle attack. You're saying that record, we're going to hijack the record and give you something else because if I'm outside of the United States, I'm going to actually get to the website that I'm after. Uh, DNSSEC, which is a secure implementation of DNS, very oversimplified, but essentially asks to encrypt end-to-end -end your connection. So the ISP doesn't know, can't, can't get in there and do a man-in-the-middle attack, and neither can anybody else. And so when you ask for saralane.com, the table looks it up and says, this is the IP address, and you get that IP address because it's encrypted end-to-end. -end. SOPA would make it illegal to have that IP address, uh, that encrypted IP address end-to-end. -end. It would require it to be less secure. The way it's written now, anyway. Well, Tom, this works so well in China. I don't know why you think it wouldn't work here. <laughs> it does work. In fact, <laughs> uh, we could probably just lift it. They probably have done yeah. some good code work to allow us to, uh, to move it up. So, anyway, you can decide on your own what you think of SOPA, but uh, if you want a secure DNS system, you probably don't want it the way it's written now. Yeah, when you put it that way, <laughs> yeah. something valid and important. Right. Questions have been brought up right there. Uh, let's move on to the news views. <laughs> AT&T and T-Mobile's proposed merger just took another blow. The Wall Street Journal reports that FCC Chairman Julius Janikowski will ask for a formal hearing on the proposed merger. The Department of Justice has already filed its lawsuit to block the deal, so the FCC hearing would happen after that suit is resolved. T-Mobile will exist independently, it looks like, for a few more months in 2012 than we thought before. Canalis says Apple could be the top PC vendor before Q3 of 2012. That's as long as you count the iPad as a PC. Currently, HP is the leader of the pack, but the research firm thinks the iPad 3 will be integral in Apple's move to the top. Canalis also says that the Ultrabook adoption will not be widespread unless prices drop considerably. And they're probably right. Major publisher Penguin Group is removing its e-books from libraries, citing security concerns. Overdrive, the digital dist distributor from many libraries, posted on its blog that it was able, it was told to disable Get for Kindle functionality for all Penguin titles, but it is working to bring the titles back. Meanwhile, the decision has the American Library Association pretty upset. ALA president-elect Maureen Sullivan said, if Penguin has an issue with Amazon, we ask that they deal with Amazon directly and not hold libraries hostage to a conflict of business models. The University of Washington and Aalto University in Finland have successfully created a contact lens that can receive data via an embedded antenna and display, in this case, one single pixel right on your eyeball. Uh, the hope is, though, that one day many more pixels can be crammed into that contact lens and give you all kinds of augmented reality goodness right there in your eye. Right now, the research team has tested the contact lens on rabbits, so watch out for rabbits. <laughs> The tour project is calling on people to donate bandwidth by setting up bridge relays on Amazon's EC2 service. Since there's no complete public list of all the bridges, it becomes difficult for any ISP or authority to block traffic on that network. The tour project says it's only taking it only takes a few minutes to set up a bridge on Amazon. If you want full instructions, you can check out cloud.tourproject.org. 
AT&T alerted customers that it was subject of a, an organized and systematic attack, but that it did not believe data was compromised. AT&T says the hackers were using scripts to find out if AT&T phone numbers were linked to AT&T online accounts, but did not provide more details. The attack was on 1 million accounts, which is only 1% of AT&T's total accounts. You may not need a party the next time you install Windows, because Microsoft says you're not going to have to sit there and babysit it. Uh, you can complete an install of Windows 8 in 11 clicks, roughly speaking. A Windows 7 upgrade took up to 60 screens, but Microsoft has also detailed a super upgrade, which covers 1.44 million files and 120 apps. That took Windows 7 over eight hours, but Windows 8 did it in less than an hour. We could actually be able to upgrade Windows and not lose an entire day. That's just crazy. That's crazy talk, I know. <laughs> Microsoft just bought VideoSurf. Who's that? Well, they're a video discovery company. VideoSurf's tech can search video by identifying images and frames so that you can find content. Microsoft says to expect this technology to pop up in the Xbox 360, the Xbox Live, and they didn't officially disclose the price, but TechCrunch Europe is saying that the deal went for about $70 million. Marom, an electronics parts supplier working with Osaka University, has created a chip that successfully achieved wireless data speeds of 1.5 gigabits per second by using terahertz frequencies at 300 gigahertz. When can we expect these chips? Uh, they won't be mass produced for three to four years, but the company also says that 30 gigabit per second will also be possible in the future, and th those chips should cost less than $5 to produce. Let's move on to the randomizer. Randomizer. Thank you. That's what I just said. I, Rachel Brown is not very happy with Groupon right now. She owns a small bakery called Need a Cake. You know, most bakeries are named puns, but I think this one's just very straightforward. Like, Need a cake? Need a cake? We're a bakery. That's what we we sell. can make one for you. <laughs> uh, but she. Oh, wait. Need a cake? Right. Oh, yeah. yep, there it is. Yeah, 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 yeah. Couldn't, couldn't get out of that one. Yeah. Nope. You uh, need bread. You don't Rachel need a cake. Brown. Yeah, you don't need cakes. <laughs> what kind of cakes are you having? You, you need the, you need <laughs> you need the, the dough. dough. Right? Not, not in a cake. Not in a no. cake. There's not. No. Oh, come on, you guys. Why ruin so this it's, pun? So, in other words, it's a really awful pun. <laughs> 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 Maybe she makes things other than cakes. In other too. words, don't eat her cakes. She needs to know. a bagel. Uh, anyway. Too cakey. <laughs> Rachel Brown is also out of business, practically. Uh, she just lost $20,000 because she put a coupon on Groupon. Uh, you, you hear these stories a lot about how Groupon is bad for merchants as often as it's good. She offered up a 75% discount on a dozen cupcakes, forcing her to make over 100,000 cupcakes oh to fill all the orders. Uh, she had to actually bring in contract agency staff to add to her usual staff so the cupcakes weren't as good because they weren't as experienced. Uh, and, and she had uh, people coming in at 3 a.m. and making cakes, making cupcakes. Well, wow. Groupon destroys another life. <laughs> well, no, this is, I mean, this is, stomp on. this is a very um, aggressive version of the Groupon issue yeah. that small business vendors have been having since day one, where there's a, there's a deal, it's popular, that all is great in theory, until they can't fulfill it or people are mad because they come in with the deal, you know, the day after and they're a loyal customer and they don't get half off and... It, it's a real headache. Is there a way to use Groupon? Christopher, do you know? Is there a way to use we, Groupon that works? We actually cover this a lot on the blog. And uh, the real key seems to be limiting the size of the promotion that you do. Um, she got caught, sounds like, in this mess because it was an unlimited promotion. Mm -hmm. You can't make 100,000 customers happy. Uh, you limit the size. You limit the scope. Um, you put very strict restrictions on how you can use these deals and if when you do that a lot of businesses do seem to be happy with the results i would think that it would be incumbent upon and i, I don't know whether they do this or not but incumbent upon groupon to kind of spell that out to someone like especially someone in her position which is like when they're making this deal do they ever spell that out and say you know it's possible that you're gonna have to fill a couple of hundred thousand cupcakes if you leave that limit off are you okay with that it certainly would be in groupon's best interest yeah. to do so because you don't want to anger your customers and they, yeah. and they may i don't know yeah, so well, that's she, may just not she just didn't hear it, I guess. Attention. I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't know. I have not done a Groupon discount. But it's sure. not like Groupon doesn't lose here. They do, too, because people say these right. Groupon deals are yeah. crap. That was a bad bakery. Yeah, they so took forever to make my need, cupcakes. Right. Get, get, get your communication in order. But when as I, we've learned from the HP WebOS thing, <laughs> people love a discount, even if it's crap. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's true. A, 
Hey, this is a bad cupcake, but half off. Crap cake, but 75% <laughs> off. Crap cake. <laughs> All right, let's take another break and thank our other sponsor for today's show, Epson Workforce Pro, the world's fastest two-sided ink jet printer. And I can say that because we've used it right here in this very office. Uh, Epson has engineered the Workforce Pro for productivity, delivering high-speed automatic two-sided color printing. I'm... I read this copy before we tried it out, and I was like, okay, it better be a little faster than... My it's really fast. It, I mean, you press... You can print from your phone, first of all, uh, because it has a natural app, and it's easy to set up. Uh, I can print from Simple Note. I don't even have to use the app. Uh, and when, as soon as I press print, it's like that. If they're on the same network, which, you know, that's the way you're going to set it up, you're there. Plus, you know that ink cartridges are where they stick you with printers, Ink cartridges for the Epson Workforce Pro have extra high capacity, giving you 50% less cost per page versus color laser. <coughs> and it prints from mobile devices, as I mentioned. Plus, it has a 580-sheet paper capacity, so you're not always going like, who didn't load the paper last time? Because you can just keep it loaded up for a long time. That's the Epson Workforce Pro. Check it out at Epson.com. Epson, built to perform. And we thank them for their support of Tech News Today. On to the calendar. Today is the end of the road for the Gmail app for BlackBerry. Really? No more fun. No more sunshine. You hear that? No more updates. Oh, wait. It's regular BlackBerry, not the play. No more though. love. They never got the Gmail app. No more either. cupcakes. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. It's not going anywhere. It won't disappear. Just, Just no more support. No more support. Yeah. RIP Gmail app for BlackBerry innovation. Sony's uh, dual screen tablet P is now available in the UK for about 500 British pounds. The Samsung Illusion is heading to Verizon tomorrow for 80 bucks. And TechCrunch is saying it's a ho hum phone for Android. How seasonal. S specs include, uh, yeah, it's a ho ho hum phone for Android. <laughs> you know, it's November and all. Specs include Android 2.3, 1 gigahertz processor, 3 megapixel camera. Although, although, if you're like, yeah, that's pretty ho hum for $80, what if it was? free. It's free from November 24th uh, through November 28th with a two-year contract on verizonwireless.com. So if that makes it look any more attractive, you have some options there. Microsoft has confirmed the revamp Xbox 360 dashboard will launch on December 6th. It'll have deeper connect integration, better voice recognition, Facebook sharing, plus live TV, music, and movies available for streaming, and the dashboard is in beta now. LG is holding an exclusive launch event on December 1st. What does it mean? Aren't they all exclusive? Right, yeah. Are we going to see the Google TV? Is that is that what we think? Well, I, I would assume that like the LG that's their launch strange. event. LG Nitro. Although, if they're saving something special for CES, I'm not exactly sure what this would be. It doesn't hint what kind of product it would be. It, although, it looks a little to me in that, in that invite like a TV with uh, cloth draped over it. Or possibly a CRT monitor. I think that's what it's going to be. <laughs> the return CRT of CRTs monitor. from yeah, LG. Going retro. I mean, look at it. Doesn't it it, it really looks like it. some kind of old television or It or does. Monitor. I thought that was just a podium for like something. A, desk, a desktop computer. Yeah. It, it looks like... <laughs> yeah. I think, I think, yeah, I think that's a podium. A dryer? Yeah, a dryer. <laughs> they do make yeah. dryers. It could yeah, be. they make good dryers. I mean, that's what it is. That's got, what it is. got Google TV on it. <laughs> <laughs> so while you're doing your wash, it's brilliant. It's also a printer. Take that, Samsung. Finally, the T-Mobile will offer the Samsung Galaxy S2 in white for the holiday season, if that's your bag. Not exact, uh, no exact date has been announced yet, although T-Mobile says it will be in time for the holidays. Depends on what holiday they mean, but I assume a couple weeks before Christmas. Infringe much, Samsung? Just saying. Just another patent war in the making. <laughs> Let's check what's incoming. Incoming message. Got a couple good voicemails today to play for you. Uh, first one is about Spotify's announcement where they said there's a new direction. Martin's got a suggestion for what he thinks that new direction might be. AT&T crew, this is Martin in Tampa, Florida. Uh, just regarding the Spotify announcement speculation, maybe the direction is vertical, as in Spotify is going to become label. This would also be timely given that they just lost 200 plus indie labels under that one uh, distributor. So. Just a thought, global announcement, global label, Spotify. Thank you. Can I just point out, that, that great, would be wild. great, great call. Yeah. Uh, in interesting thought, kept comprehensive and short. <laughs> well done, Martin. We love you, Martin. I think, I think that's... <laughs> I do, anyway. You're a gentleman and a scholar. I think that's a, it's a very interesting. Yeah. I'm not sure it's very likely because of the difficulties involved, but it's not impossible. I mean, Google's doing that with Google Music, that independent artists right. can sign up, yeah. so why not follow their Spotify lead? Spotify could do something like that. Where they're it's not good, so much a label, just a platform. It's a, it's a great thought. That actually becomes more likely when you put it that way. I hope that's what it is. Chris, would you put your band on Spotify? 
Yes, <laughs> it is on Spotify. <laughs> is your band yeah, already? I'm in? not going to tell you what it's called, though. <laughs> no, I think Spotify sounds great. I, I, if I was a band, that's where I'd go. Yeah. No, that's a, that you know, and like he said, they just lost that indie uh, label, so they could they could fill out their category. Mm-hmm. Nice, nice job, Martin. Got another uh, voicemail here from Portlandia. Uh, Tim has some thoughts on Netflix and the idea of them having commercials. Hello, gang. This is Tim in Portland. I wanted to weigh in on the Netflix and the commercials. I'm a huge Netflix fan, and I would much rather see them raise the price to thirty or forty dollars a month for streaming instead of put one stinking commercial on that thing if they ever do that i'll simply call up and cancel love the show bye <laughs> now, let's be clear there is no 30 to 40 dollars a month i think he's i think he's exaggerating well uh, i don't know he, he sounded it, so. pretty emphatic about there is the fact no that he... evidence that a netflix is in any way considering adding commercials but we, we brought up the you know possibility yesterday and uh i i, I think we we have your answer netflix if you were to ever consider that well, I mean, if if Tim can pay forty dollars a month just to not get like a ten second pre roll, Netflix is doing great. So the yeah, the answer is Netflix <laughs> threaten to add commercials and then raise your rates to forty dollars. <laughs> You'll keep Tim. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do that, Netflix. <laughs> Don't do that. I'm not adding to this. Let's move on to uh, uh, a couple emails about Sky- SCADA system. Somebody said it's a short A. I don't know. I think it's an acronym. You can pronounce it any way you want, but S-C-A-D-A systems. Uh, Cable Ninja says, please don't use my real name. I work for the man, but I need to share this rant in reference to the continuing coverage of the hacked Illinois SCADA system. I have a little perspective on this story. Having worked as a system network and firewall admin in public utilities and universities through the years, I've had to deal with these utilities, or these cooties time and time again. This continuing problem is merely a failure of common sense. Why do unprotected SCADA systems unpack 15-year-old PCs driving HVAC systems and various wall wart implementations need internet routable addresses? Why do vending machines, etc. need to be visible to the internet? NAT, people, NAT. He's talking about network ad- address translation. Wouldn't it be ridiculously simple to put these WFO operating systems behind a less than $50 Soho router? Thanks for all of those in the Twitterverse. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, yes, Cable Ninja, absolutely. They, they, if they need to be connected to the Internet at all, at least put them behind a firewall that is, makes them invisible. So you cannot find them with a Google search, as Tom Parker did at Black Hat last year. Also, Brian Drake uh, from Tennessee wrote in and said, you know, some of the reasons that they put these on the Internet is so they can save on labor costs. You don't have to send somebody out to the pump. Mm-hmm. You can just scan them. I feel like you could do that with an internal network and not have to have them on the Internet. Or do a uh, VPN or do something. Try try to build some, I don't know, security into this? I don't know. This is a crazy idea. Oh, security. Why would you, <laughs> why would you ever want that in your public, <laughs> your, your public uh, utilities? Leave that to Steve Gibson. <laughs> he should be in security. charge. Security, now! <laughs> <laughs> He'll fix it. Just walk up and yell it. Next email. Uh, this is directed at Tom uh, regarding you having no option to not upload your I podcast. I was complaining that Google, Google Music, Music uploaded podcasts whether I wanted them to or not. Anyone who's having the same problem, see if you can follow along. Hey, Tom, this is from Bill B. You can uncheck uh, upload podcasts in Google Music options. I just deleted 2,000 plus podcasts and turned it off this weekend. If you go to options, advanced, include podcast podcasts and uploads and then uncheck that option then if you go to google uh, dot music dot com genre search podcast highlight all and then right click in the bottom corner go ahead and delete I had 2,300 podcasts that had been uploaded every day since google music beta started so there you go all right thank you bill I actually thanked bill already in email but I thought I'd share that with everybody else yeah. I, I, had, I was menu blind I had no idea that was there yeah that's awesome those advanced menu options, they'll get you. That, you know, I just, I remember working on the Mac in the 80s. And what I loved about it is I could just use the menu to learn how to use it. You just mm-hmm. go through. I don't do that anymore. It's like something you lose when you get older. You just stop investigating all the menus on things. Yeah, I know that from apps. It's like they'll, they'll have a welcome screen and I'm just like, I don't want to do that. And yeah. then I don't know how it works yeah. half the and time. Exactly. <laughs> and then you have only yourself to blame. Right. All right, thanks everybody uh, for listening or watching, and thanks for submitting stories. Technewstoday.reddit.com. Uh, it helps us figure out what stories we want to cover each day. So go there, 
it's not only just about submitting, but voting. Uh, put your put your mark on there. You want you see a story that you like, press it up. You see a story you're like, I do not want them to talk about that. Vote it down. Technewstoday.reddit.com. And don't forget to submit your favorite moments of TNT or any show on Twit at twit.tv slash best of. We're putting together our best moments of the year. And we want you to pick them. Tell us what you liked. Or even if you just thought it was terribly embarrassing and should be in the com compilation show at the end. Twit.tv slash best of. Thank you, Christopher Knoll, for being on the show again. It's great to have you back for a fifth time. We'll make it a sixth. I, ho I hope you'll come back. I can't wait. I'm going to go through all my menus, though, first. <laughs> yeah. I'll be there. You're you're still young. You can you can go through menus like that. You have the capacity. <laughs> Let folks know about your uh, blog on Intuit and where they can find it. Blog.intuit.com. We write about small business news, a lot of tech stuff too, every day. Check it out. Thanks again, and thank you, folks, for watching. You can find us on the web at twit.tv slash TNT. Email us, TNT at twit.tv. Give us a call. Leave us some voicemails. We've been getting some good ones lately from folks. Follow their example. 260-TNT show. Paul Therott from Win Supersite and Windows Weekly joins us tomorrow on Tech News Today. We'll see you then. La bam bam bam. All right.